Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Go ahead and share this page and like it and send it to your friends and family because today we're going to do part three of gastrointestinal disorders. And we're going to go over the different mechanisms and how we think about patients when they come in and have GI issues. Okay, so on the board behind me, we're going to look at the red portion first, okay, the red lettering. When we have a patient that comes into our office, we evaluate them from north to south, basically from mouth to rectum, okay? So north to south type of clinical thinking is necessary in order to determine what type of patient this person is, uh, what type of condition this patient is coming in with, and where do we have to go first, all right? So when we look at this continuum, we have north to south, uh, in terms of symptomatology, right? When a patient comes in, do we say, do they have proper smell? Can they smell things or they have lost a sense of smell and taste over time, right? Do they have proper saliva production when they go, ah, and look at their mouth? The tongue should be shiny and red. Do they have proper uh, uh, saliva production? Do they have fungal overgrowth or candida in the mouth? Can the patient swallow? Right? When we go open, say, ah, and we should see that palate move, some patients, when we repeat the movement and go, ah, 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 the palate no longer moves, right? So we have to make sure they can swallow. Do they have enough HCL production, right? Hydrochloric acid production in the stomach. Do they have proper pancreatic enzyme release? Do they have a gallbladder, right? Did they have their gallbladder removed? Or is their gallbladder sluggish as a result of maybe autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Then we have uh, duodenal microvilli where we can absorb foods properly. Intestinal permeability, that can be a lot of different causes. ICV is ileocecal valve. It's a valve on the right lower quadrant that prevents bacteria from the large intestine to migrate into the small intestine. And uh, malfunction of the ileocecal valve um, can create things like SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Oral tolerance. Does this patient come in, they can only eat 10 foods, otherwise they get very bloated, they feel sick, they feel nauseous, right? Do they have proper oral tolerance? Microbiome, right? Do we have gut diversity? Do we eat a wide variety of vegetables and fruits? Uh, to have the right gut microbiome fuel as well as the right microbiome. Colon reabsorption of water and excretion of fecal matter, right? We look at the patient from north to south and then say, what is the underlying mechanism? So if we look on the bottom over here, we look at patients in terms of, based on those symptoms, can they have a neurological problem? Do they have a GI infection? Do they have a metabolic problem like insulin resistance or, or um, diabetes, right? Immune dysregulation or autoimmunity. So when we look at this continuum and we dice and, and intersect it with the symptoms and, and you know what the patient is experiencing, then we can kind of come to a conclusion as to where the problem might be. It might be autoimmune, it might be metabolic. It might be even neurological in early neurodegeneration, like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or dementia, right? So just to recap, north to south, when you have loss of smell, it can be a neurological problem. It says neuro, right? Saliva production could be neurodegenerative, or sometimes medication can do that, dry mouth and so forth. Chewing could be a problem with muscles of mastication. Right? It could be a neurological issue or it could be a TMJ, a you know, physical problem, right? Swallowing, that can be neurology. It could be something called a vagus nerve. Can we have the proper swallowing mechanism? HCL production could be metabolic. It could be, be due to antacids, uh, poor food choices, as well as infection and neurology. Pancreatic enzyme release can be neurological also, or can you have a physical issue there? Gallbladder release of bile could be metabolic or autoimmune. Duodenum or microvilli, celiac disease, food issues, it can kind of decimate the gut microvilli. 
Uh, intestinal permeability can be antibiotics or SAD or standard American diet issues. Uh, IC valve is neuro or it could be SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Oral tolerance can be SIBO, neuro, um, gut microbiome could be lack of diversity in the gut uh, due to poor food choices and then dietary uh, intake. So we look at a patient in terms of their symptomatology. We go through kind of this whole checklist and then we try to match it with what the underlying mechanism might be for a patient. Where is the underlying problem, right? Is it neurological infection, metabolic, immune, or autoimmune? So if you have an infection and you just treat it like it has just a digestive enzyme issue, then is that patient going to feel better? Be a little bit, but you have to eradicate the infection for that patient to really feel better, right? So I'm going to flip this board. And I'm going to give you two cases, okay? So a patient comes in and they tell me, or during my examination, I realize they can't smell very well, right? And then when I check the neurological portion or the vagal uh, function, they have poor vagal function and they have difficulty swallowing, right? This is the person who eats and takes forever to eat, right? They're a slow eater. They can't swallow. They just keep chewing, right? HCL release, you have pancreatic enzyme release, ileocecal valve, and excretion of, of fecal matter. Let's say they're constipated all the time. No matter what they do, they're always taking a laxative, right? Uh, they need a, a special tea. They're always doing trying something in order to get the bowels moving. All these signs right in here can be an early sign of neurodegeneration. So this patient who has all these problems is likely going to be a neurological patient, not just a GI patient, because you have to fix the underlying mechanisms. So all neurodegenerative patients are progressive, right? No matter what you do to halt it, you might, you might be able to help them in a certain way, but if they get too far advanced in their neurodegeneration, our job is just to stop it from progressing because neurodegeneration will progress over time, okay? So you have patient number one, we have all these symptoms, and it's most likely a neurological patient. Now, when we look over here, we have a patient who has gallbladder release, uh, uh, they have a problem with gallbladder releasing their bile, they have duodenal and microvilli uh, as malabsorption issues, and gut microbiome uh, development is no good, right? So let's say you have somebody who has insulin resistance and diabetes, right? Um, they're eating very poorly and so forth. They're going to have poor gut microbiome and they're going to atrophy their microvilli. And then if you have, you know, a patient who goes, you know what? I can't even eat fish oil. If I have fish oil, I burp it all up. And then when you check their uh, blood work and their vitamin D, despite them taking, let's say, 5,000 units of vitamin D, the vitamin D will still be low. So we look at these patients and we go, hmm, what kind of patient is this? When we look at a, a patient like this through a clinical lens, we say this patient is a metabolic patient. Okay, so we handle patients very differently from a neuro patient to a metabolic patient. First point of attack might be different for this two patients, right? So we have to say, does on top of this, do they have autoimmune disease? Do they have other underlying mechanisms? It's important to understand that north to south mechanism and then try to pinpoint what is it? Is it infection? Is it autoimmunity? Is it dysregulation of the immune system? Is it um, neurological or metabolic? We have to figure those things out in order to properly attack a problem, right? And, and I'm going to be honest with you. Every patient that walks in our door, we can't guarantee that we can help them. Some of these patients are so far advanced in their neurodegeneration, no matter what we do, we probably won't change things. We can help their quality of life and do some things. 
And then you have some patients who come in and they're eating a poor diet and they have all these things going on and they have all these symptoms, yet if we do a few things for them, it can completely change their lives. So it really depends on the individual, what is happening with them, how long these symptoms have been ongoing, and what is the motivation of that patient to get better. Oftentimes when a patient comes in, they go, hey, listen, based on what you're telling me and some lab testing that we did, it looks like you have issues with gluten, which is your breads and pastas. You have to stop eating gluten. They just go, hmm, I can't do that, doc. Then my answer is, I can't help you, right? So the patient's motivation and drive is also necessary in order for them to, uh, to recover from any uh, gastrointestinal issues, okay? So my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. And we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. And next week, we're going to start a series on thyroid issues. All right. So stay tuned. Have a great day.